So I don't know if any of you know this, but when I prepare for sermons on Sundays, and just on, on many days, on Wednesday it's a lot easier, but on Sundays, usually my ideas just come from my own personal Bible reading and going through Scripture. And we were talking about this in a preaching class yesterday. And, you know, sometimes things just kind of stand out to you and it's kind of jump out and it's like, man, that's, that's cool. It's a, you know, it's a great truth. And whether it's something new you're learning or just something you maybe have already known, but you're just kind of paying attention to and taking notice of it. After we did the uh, whole New Testament Bible reading in January, of course, we've been going, I've been going through the Old Testament now because I just started back over and started from Genesis and been going through and just... I don't know, in the past month, one of the things that stuck out to me in general was how many times you see when you go through the Old Testament, you go through the, the books of Moses and, and you go through Leviticus and in Numbers especially, you're seeing all these references to making this distinction between clean and unclean. And it's just, I mean, we just read through this entire chapter in Numbers 19 and, and God's just being very specific on, hey, if you touch a dead body, you're unclean. You need to purify yourself. You need to be washed. You're going to be separated. You're going to be unclean for seven days. You're going to be unclean until even. And there's all these different scenarios that just over and over and over again. And then you go into the clean versus the unclean beasts and the animals and what you could eat. And then you go into all, these, all this difference and this separation and division of clean versus unclean. And it's been kind of way, I'm like, man, it's just, the Bible just talks about this so much. This is kind of a theme, and I've just been mulling over that for, for quite a while. And, you know, I kind of want to preach on this, but I'm not exactly sure what to cover and what to hit and how to apply it and what we're going to, you know, what I really want to apply and, and, and learn and take away from this passage. Because it is such a great truth. But I like trying to apply it somewhere that, that's going to make a lot of sense for us today. I mean, one real basic is just general cleanliness, right? Of course, we ought to be bathing ourselves and routinely washing ourselves and, and keeping clean. And a lot of that sounds like a no-brainer today. And part of the reason is because science is caught up to the Bible, and when, there's, when you go to the doctor or you have any operations or medical procedures, now it's a very big deal to have a sterile environment, right? Everything needs to be washed and clean. But you know what? That's not the way that things have been for a real long time. Right. It's relatively recent that, that all of that amount of cleanliness was incorporated in medicine. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't like that like real long ago in the past, but... Just in our, in our modern recent history here, um, there's people, a lot of people getting infections and, and getting all kinds of diseases and dying because of a lack of cleanliness. And you can get that, I mean, if you, just from reading the scripture and not throwing away the Old Testament, right? Because you're not going to get this teaching nearly from the New Testament that you're getting from the Old Testament here. I mean, God's really spelling this out on the importance of this cleanliness. So, the truth has been here all along. It's just up to people to, to look at it and say, and, and decide, no, this is actually true. I'm not just going to lean on man's wisdom and whatever the doctor says is true at whatever given time period I have to be living in and just rely on that. Because, folks, if we rely on just man's wisdom, it changes all the time all the time every generation that has existed is going to be the one to say we're the smartest we know the most we've got all the answers the people that came before us they didn't really know what they were doing but now we have modern technology now we know how to how to treat people now we know what we're doing that is the way it's always been people always have this mindset it's not going to change 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, unless Christ comes back first, it's going to be the same thing. They're going to look back on what's being done now and go, can you believe they were doing this? Can you believe they were doing that? Just as we can do today. And just as they did 100 years ago. And just, you know, this, is, this has been the progression. But there's always stupid things being done. No matter what generation you're in, 
You're always going to find things that are done that are not right. But thank God his word doesn't change. And if we can go and find our principles and just basic truths, we could find them all here from Scripture and we should be able to apply that to everything else. I am, I, I'm going to start off by saying this too. I'm a big fan of science because we're going to be preaching on the, the naysayers and the people are going to scoff at a sermon like this are, gonna, are, are just going to laugh. Oh, you Bible thumper, you know, you, you don't, you don't uh, believe in science. You don't believe, you know, it's like, no, I do. I do. I actually believe in science that's real science. Something that's really observable, something that's really provable and testable and um, is, has not been obfuscated by money and corruption and, and people with an agenda to push whatever it is they want for greed, for filthy lucre's sake. And the topic, and, and this is what I've said, I've been, I've been trying to figure out how do I want this apply. Well, with the recent events that have been going on in California, in Washington, in many other places, now there's been legislation being passed to force people to vaccinate their kids. And there's this um, measles outbreaks, right? Measles outbreaks. Oh, man, this is horrible. This disease should have been eradicated. You know, it's, it was basically gone and now it's coming back. And it's because these people aren't vaccinating their kids. And what I'm going to be preaching about, obviously, today is vaccinations. Amen. And I'm going to preach on why no Bible-believing Christians should ever inject themselves or inject their children with a vaccine. With a vaccine. Amen. Amen. And, and we're going to go to, and yeah, we're going to look at some Old Testament to get this truth and this understanding. But I've, I've got statistics, I've got Bible, I've got whatever it is, hopefully, that you need to show you that this is not something that Bible believers should be doing. Now, let me also start off and preface this because there's so many objections. I try to handle as many as I can when I preach a sermon, try to cover all bases. There's no way this is a big topic. I cover everything. I do not believe that the, the practice of vaccination is some huge conspiracy that like every doctor that, that vaccinates kids is like some wicked person and they're out to hurt people and they're just devious. I don't believe that for a second. What's happened is that there's this medical establishment that's pushing out information that is pushing out false information. And that is getting people to subscribe to something, medical professionals, because they're trusting and they're relying in the source of their information. The vast majority, I would say probably 99% of the doctors who are actually performing the vaccinations, they're not the ones researching the vaccinations. They're not the ones, you know, right. and by research, maybe they're reading something that's been given to them. But they're not actually doing the testing in the work themselves. Now, granted, that's, of course, no one has time to go back and, and do all the work yourself. You have to try to rely on something. But my point is, if you're given bad information to start with, that doesn't make you a bad person individually, but you are relying on something that, that is false. I mean, fluoride is another good example of that. There's a lot of dentists that promote the use of fluoride and they've been given bad information. But I'm not, that's, a, that's a separate, totally separate topic, but it's along the same lines. We're going to be looking at vaccinations because the whole theory, just, just from a real basic level, the whole theory of vaccinations is this. In order for you to not get a disease, you need to be injected with that disease. In order for you not to get the disease, we have to give you the disease. We're going to see, and you do see throughout Scripture, when people are sick, when people have an issue, when they have an issue of blood, when they have a pestilence, when they're lepers, they're unclean. 
And we can read an entire chapter about leprosy and multiple chapters about leprosy and, and how to diagnose it. And at the end of the day, though, they are unclean. And if they have a fretting leprosy, they have to walk around and, and their mouth is covered and go, unclean, unclean, so people know that they're unclean and they can stay away from them. Why? Because having a disease and having a pestilence is unclean. Just at the very basic level, simplistically, when you look at what the scripture covers about clean and unclean, are you going to want to, do you think it's right to just start injecting yourself with things that are unclean? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, you don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, the context of that passage is referring to fornication. However, that truth still stands. So yes, we need to honor our body. The body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. We shouldn't be joining our body to another person in fornication, outside of the rules that God is, has given us. But at the same time, we can take that truth that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and apply it to other aspects that affect our body. So it's not just fornication that we shouldn't do because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. How about polluting our bodies with cigarettes, cigarette smoke? or other drugs, or even alcohol. Now, obviously, there's other prohibitions against alcohol in the scriptures, but if you just were to treat your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost, hey, there's a lot of things. How about obesity? How about you know, many other things that you say, hey, no, this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to keep this temple clean. I'm born again. I'm saved. The Holy Ghost is literally residing inside of you this morning if you're a child of God. Yeah, Are you going to take that temple and say, here, load me up with some disease? Yeah. How about this? Who here believes that God has wonderfully created human beings and everything else that exists on this planet? Yeah, amen. I believe that. I think God had a pretty good plan. When you research and when you look at actual science and biology and anatomy and you look at how things work, isn't it incredible how God has created this system within our body to handle cuts and scrapes and bruises and introduction of infection and, and things that don't belong in your body? I was having a discussion with someone the other day at work just about allergies in general and how an allergy, it's a response from your body when your nose starts running and you start sneezing, your body's trying to expel something. There's something that's detected inside your body your body doesn't want there. So the system that God created in your body is saying, okay, let's flush this out. Let's get this stuff out. It's going to cause you to sneeze. It's going to cause your nose to run. It's going to cause these other things to happen. Why? Because God has just built us incredibly intelligently. And it's a wonder, and there's so many things that, don't e that, people, that science today still can't even explain. Like how a baby really is formed and fashioned in the womb. You can observe it, but there still is no... What, what is it that's causing the cells to multiply? Right at conception. What, what's doing that? Science can't explain that. Science definitely can't reproduce that. They could introduce the ingredients for that to happen, but they can't cause that to happen. Right. They, fully, they don't completely know. So you mean to tell me, in God's great creation, in creating mankind, that he's created us so full of flaws that in order for a person to have a healthy life, Hey, man, when they're a few months old, you need to start injecting them with a bunch of diseases. Otherwise, they're not going to be healthy and be able to live their life the way that they're supposed to. Do you think God is that flawed? That he requires mankind to come along and say, oh, hold on a second here. We need to make an improvement on this process. If you're going to do what's right, we need to load up that little baby full of all kinds of, of filthy diseases yeah, right. to prevent them from getting filthy diseases when they grow up. 
It's crazy. Amen. It's great. You know, but you know what? They're not selling it to you like that. Yeah. When you hear me say it like that, that sounds nuts, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But one of the big problems is that this science falsely so-called relies on a very false and faulty premise that God didn't create everything, that we've evolved. Modern microbiology starts off with the understanding that everything that came here happened by chance and they believe in this natural selection nonsense that, hey, our ancestors are monkeys and we came from these single-celled organisms that just somehow turned into other creatures and crawled out of, of the ooze onto land and you know, grew wings and started to fly and somehow all of this stuff just happened because, I mean, we're here, right? Instead of just believing God created us, God designed us. No, all of it, just somehow the, this whole system that we have, the whole ecosystem, internal system, systems within each and every creature that exists on this planet, all by chance. Yeah, right, you fool. You're not going to believe in a God. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Amen. The fool's going to re rest his science on that notion that, hey, this is all by chance. And they, they look at information through that lens that this is, all, this is all just part of evolution. And when you, from, your very, <laughs> from the very beginnings, from the source, when you veer off of the truth... You keep going down that path. See, the truth is a straight and narrow, right? Just imagine a straight line. You've got truth. When at the very beginning of whatever, whatever your foundation is, you're going to build upon. The foundation of microbiology is evolution. They've already started going the wrong way. Just starting there. Well, if you're going to keep building on that foundation... You're going to keep going, and the farther you go, the farther away you're going to find yourself from, from the truth. Yeah, right. It's not right. I don't, we're not going to read this. I have Leviticus 15 in my notes, too. It basically covers what we already saw and read in Numbers chapter 19. I want to show you, at this point... Well, before I, even get in, before I even get into my little charts here, I got some charts for you. Besides the fact that the vaccines that they give you actually have the disease that you, they want you to prevent. And trying to think of how I want to say this because I've done a lot, I've done a lot of studying just personally on this subject. Because it was important for me. When I, before I even had any children, I wanted to know what the truth was on this matter. And at that time, I hadn't really heard a lot of preaching from Scripture. And that's why I'm focusing so much just on Scripture today. Because it's, it's way more important than what other, other information I give you. I'm going to give you other information because it's all logical. It all makes sense. It all adds up. But God's word is what is really what matters the most. Turn to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. The problem isn't even just in the disease that you're injecting yourself with when you get a vaccine. In order for that disease to be kept in a state that your body is going to respond to, they need to add what's called adjuvants to the solution that gets injected into your blood or into your muscle or wherever they end up injecting the shot into. And oftentimes, most of the time, if not all the time, those adjuvants are actually poisonous. They're actually really bad for you to be having in your, in your system for the longest time, and they still do use it today, folks, even if they're going to try to tell you, oh, no, no, we don't use it anymore. Mercury is a heavy metal. Yeah. 
and it's and it's toxic and it's not good for your body to have mercury injected into it and it causes all kinds of health problems yet they still use it as an adjuvant dimerosol now it may be removed from some you know mmr vaccines or some other vaccines but they still have it in some vaccines to this day even though that's already been demonstrated to have bad effects on you when you get that injected. But then there's aluminum. There's even formaldehyde that they use as these adjuvants to, to go along with the disease. Because the disease needs to, to not just die off. So in many cases, what you're getting is a weakened virus, right? So if they're, if they're trying to immunize you against a virus or against a bacteria, they're going to take that and they, they need it to still be alive so that your body can produce the antibodies to try to fight off what's there. Cause that's, that's the whole mindset of the vaccine is they weaken it. So then they get your body producing antibodies and say, well, now you're immune from getting this disease. The problem is it's built on half science because you can see those things to be true. So what, what, what they're doing is and when I say you can see those things to be true, you can, you can observe your body having antibodies after a person is sick. You can observe certain things under a microscope and, and you know, introduce disease to healthy blood and you can, you can watch what happens. The problem is that our system is so complex in the human body that there are unknown variables that are just not even being considered when it comes to um, disease prevention. And that, the, then that God's method of a built-in immunity, because immunity is a real thing, that's legitimate. When people get sick with certain diseases, then your body has developed an immunity to certain diseases that it won't get sick with that disease again. And that goes back to God's design. The problem is that science that hasn't cracked God's code yet. And they could see bits and parts of what's happening. And they try to reproduce that. But if you notice, any time man tries to tamper and modify and change God's plan, it never works out good. With the, look, at, look at the genetically modified organisms that we have today, right? What do they try to do? They're trying to make bigger fruit, bigger vegetables, you know, uh, fatter chickens and, and all this stuff. And what are we finding out now? Oh yeah, that's going to cause cancer. Oh yeah, your body doesn't really uh, take that very well. And it's going to cause you more health problems down the road because ultimately that old saying, you are what you eat is true. Whatever it is that you consume or whatever you eat, that becomes part of you. It becomes part of your body. Your body consumes that and uses that and distributes all of that nutrition at whatever it is that you're consuming throughout your system. And when you start modifying and changing the way that God made it, you screw it up. Why? Because God had it right the first time. It doesn't need improvement. And man's lack of understanding is what's screwing it up. Oh, we didn't know that. Yeah, I know you didn't know that. Stop trying to, to improve God's system and God's process. I had you turn to Haggai chapter 2. Job 14, 4 says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Hey, we're going to try to make you clean by introducing an unclean thing into your body. Yeah. Who can do that? Nobody. That's right. Haggai chapter 2, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat shall it be holy and the priests answered and said no then said Haggai if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these shall it be unclean and the priest answered and said it shall be unclean then answered Haggai and said so is this people and so is this nation before me said the Lord and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. Basically, what he's saying here, if you look at that, he's saying if one has holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and then he touches 
something else. So something that's clean touches something else. Does that just automatically make that other thing clean? No. Does, it, does the cleanliness transfer by virtue of just touching it to something else? No. But if you have something that's unclean and you introduce that and you touch it against something that's already clean, doesn't that make that unclean? Yes, it does. Think about it this way. If I have a cup of water that's crystal clear, pure water, no impurities in it, and then I have a real murky glass of muddy water, just filthy, whatever. If I pour some clean water into that unclean water, is that just going to make it clean? Nope. No. Not at all. It's still going to be unclean. It's still going to have all its imperfections and all its impurities in there. But if I take some of that dirty water and pour it into the clean, now is that clean water going to still be clean? No. no. It's a lot easier to make things unclean than it is to make them clean. Yeah. And that's another concept that goes for everything, right? There's one way for us to be clean in God's eyes. We have to be washed. We have to be washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. But you know, there's many ways to be made unclean. Yeah. Introduction of any type of sin makes a person unclean. So you mean to tell me that I need to introduce some uncleanness to my body or to a clean body of a young infant child that God has made in order to make them clean? I don't think so. Amen. Sorry, you're not going to fool me. I'm not buying into it. And on top of that, I see what's happening. I see when people are giving their kids vaccines and then within hours, all of a sudden, their baby turns into something that is unrecognizable to them as their child because they start looking off and not being able to focus and they start having seizures and they start having these other problems, yet it's la, 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 this isn't happening. No, I can't hear you. You're just lying. That's the attitude of the vaccine. Producer. And think about this. Did you know that vaccine producers, the people who do it, the, the, the people who inject it, as well as the people who make it, cannot be sued. They cannot be held liable if they cause injury or damage by someone by their own product. Right. What else is like that in this country or in the world where you can just make whatever and you have no culpability, no responsibility to what you're doing? Right. Someone died. Right. Oops. Some child has been marred forever. They've lost their cognitive skills. They've lost, you know, they've been damaged beyond repair. Sorry. Oh, yeah, you can't seek damages, though. You know, if things are actually right and true, you don't need laws that just force the issue of forcing the, you know, the, the truth is going to come out. It's, it's like it's like with the uh, with, you know, with the with the Holocaust and, you know, there's the Holocaust denial is illegal. Yeah. Like just say, just just having an opinion or saying something didn't happen. It's like, wait, that's against the law. Yes, it is against the law in Germany in Canada and other places. It's literally a crime to just say, you know what? I don't think that things happen the way that they happened. Right. That's against the law. What do you have to be afraid of? If you have the truth, what do you have to be afraid of? Yeah, that's right. I'm not afraid when people challenge my faith or my belief and we go out soul winning and we talk to people. It's not, no, you have to believe this. And that's it. No, I don't want to hear anything else. No, I can't. La, la, la. I'm not, I don't hear you. No, challenge it. Why? Because I want to know what's true. If, you're, if you can't challenge things, then how can you ever find the truth? If it just has to be unquestioned, nope, you can't question what happened. If you do, it's against the law. Hold on a minute. That doesn't sound right. I think you've got something to hide. Yeah. Amen. And that's what they've done with the vaccine thing. But you know what? There was a, um, the government actually created 
a vaccine injury fund for people because they made this just total free course for for the medical industry to, to basically just be free of any responsibility the government said well we got to do something because there are people being injured think of the guillain barre that happened in the 70s when they were introducing these these uh, vaccines and people started getting injured by them they tried to cover it up they tried to hide it and you can't hide it when so many people are getting hurt by these things so they had to set up these funds in the 80s i think is when it is when it got established and if I remember correctly, I was looking at it last night, it's like over $4 billion has been paid out to people as a result of vaccine injury as hush money to make you go away because they don't want anyone to realize there's actual injuries that are happening here. Now, you think about this as well. It, it, as generations pass, it's harder to know what was true because if there's a, a propaganda campaign going on and you didn't live through something or you haven't been told how things were how do you know and you just keep hearing this from these authoritative sources how are you going to know the difference i know because i've heard enough people that were older than me when i grew up measles wasn't a big deal at all like I don't even know anyone that got measles when I was a kid but in the generation prior to me yeah like my parents generation they remember people having measles but you know what it wasn't that big of a deal did some people die yeah some people die from from anything yeah, right. I mean literally like like some people die from exposure some people die from the flu some people die from different things People are at different, you know, and there's different risk levels, and that's part of life. There's diseases out there, and some of them kill people and some don't. But the measles wasn't ever seen as some horrible, oh man, we, what are we ever going to do if we don't get rid of this disease? That's not the way it was. In my generation, is chicken pox. Now, I don't know what, how many people are getting chicken pox these days or not, but it wasn't that big of a deal. In fact, parents would get kids together oftentimes and just say hey this is a good age for my kid to have it they're pretty resilient they'll bounce back it's better than them getting it later when they're result, an adult and they'll they'll be immune for the rest of their life now i don't think i still don't think that's necessarily a good idea to just in, you know get your child sick i'm not again i'm not pushing that because it still goes back to it you know bringing an unclean thing into a clean thing the reason why i'm bringing that up is because it wasn't viewed as that big of a deal Right? They're just like, okay, yeah, they're going to get sick, but, but whatever. But it's easier now, it's going to be easier these days to tell younger people, oh man, chicken pox, you, I mean, it just, so it just sounds nasty. Chicken pox, like what in the world is that? Some animal disease, I don't know. <laughs> and you could just start spinning it. We, we have to eradicate this. We have to limit it. And they do have a chicken pox vaccine. And you start thinking, well, what are the odds of something bad happening to me? And if you ask the doctors, they're gonna, you know, it's, it's safe and effective. Safe and effective. Oh, this is safe and effective. Because that's what they've been taught. That's what they've been told. So everything's safe and effective. Oh, this has all been tested. Yeah, when you start looking at how they test things, you're going to find out a lot more interesting information as well. And I don't have all the facts on that, but the way that they do their blind testing with their placebos, because there's, there's a certain way that, that drugs are supposed to be tested. And when it comes to immunizations, they're not tested the same way. And I'll just leave that for you to just, to just dig that little nugget up for yourself because I, don't, because I don't have the hard, fast fact in my mind right now or on paper in front of me. But look it up. The way that they test things. And a lot of that information isn't always the easiest to find. But I mentioned the adjuvants and I mentioned the disease that you're injecting. Now, do you know where the disease comes from? Because they have to culture, spawn these viruses in the lab because they're inserting them into ultimately the, the injection that you're going to receive. Well, I'll tell you where some of them come from. 
Some of them come from aborted babies, tissue. Now, they try to downplay this and say, well, yes, the, the, they were these aborted fetuses, but they're from the 1960s or 1970s. It's really old, and it's not like there's just all these babies being murdered in order to create vaccines, and that's true. They're not continually using new abortions to create their vaccines. However, they're using aborted babies, aborted baby tissues. It, just because you're using the same one doesn't make it any better. Right, right. They try to make it sound like it's better. Oh, well, it's not like we're still doing this. I mean, it's already done. It's already happened. So let's just use it. And in a lot of the places I've been seeing, they'll, they'll, they'll reference the Catholic Church. Like, well, the Vatican says that it's okay. Like, yeah, they shouldn't have done it, but now we have it. So let's just, it's okay. Let's go ahead and use it. Folks, the Vatican is not our source of authority. And it's funny that these, that these people, these scientists will even try to point to that as if, oh, yeah, you religious people, you don't need to worry about it because the Vatican says it's okay. Yeah, I, th I think I'll just research it myself. I think I'll just go with the Bible, not what the Pope says. But here's some information for you. The MRC5 cell line, because it's, a, it's the cells that they're culturing these diseases off of. So there's one that's known as the MRC5 cell line was developed in September 1966 from lung tissue taken from a 14-week fetus aborted. And fetus means baby. Okay, let's just be clear. I'll, I'll replace this word. A 14-week baby aborted for psychiatric reasons from a 27-year-old physically healthy woman. MRC5 is a known source of human DNA and vaccines. You're injecting part of that DNA into your body when you get these vaccines, at least the one that has the MRC5. How about this one? The WI38 human diploid cell line was derived by L. Hayflick from the lung tissue of a three-month-old aborted human female baby. Yeah, it says fetus. I'm calling it a baby. The rubella vaccine currently used in the U.S. and in most countries was developed after an American researcher at the Wistar Institute cultured rubella virus from a fetus aborted because the mother was infected with rubella. This vaccine is called RA27-3 because the rubella virus was isolated from the 27th aborted fetus sent to the Wistar Institute in the 1964 rubella outbreak. Sounds like a good source of what I want to inject into my body. The last point I'm going to make here, I'm going to get to my charts, is that I don't even believe they actually work. Even if they came from a good source, even if you can justify and say, well, this really isn't bad or whatever, you, you know, however you want to try to justify things, I don't even think they're effective. I don't, they're not safe and they're not effective. Yep. I'm going to read a news story for a part of a news story uh, from, it's a 2015 Fox News story from Davie County, North Carolina. And, it, and it's about pertussis, which is also known as the whooping cough. So this was another disease that was more common, you know, maybe a century ago. More, more kids had this. And people still get it today. And this is a report of an outbreak. It says it's a serious bacteria. It causes spasms of severe coughing, which can cause those who have it to vomit and lose breath. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's not pleasant. Not something I want to have or I want my kids to have. But it's still one of these diseases that you get well from, just like you do from any other sickness, and isn't, doesn't just have this huge mortality rate that you wouldn't find in any other disease. But um, it says in the worst cases, it can be deadly. Yeah, the worst, the worst cases of the flu can be deadly too. In recent weeks, it made its way to two schools in Davie County. The first case was reported on December 7th. Today, the, the school system reported 13 confirmed cases 
11 in Davie High School and two in the early college. The article continues on. It says, the spread of whooping cough is not, or excuse me, is most easily prevented by receiving the DTAP shot. So they're, they're pushing the vaccine, saying, well, if you get this vaccine, you know, it's pre easily preventable by that. It says, however, and this is particularly troubling, all 13 of the people confirmed to have pertussis had gotten the vaccine. Huh. Well, I thought you said that vaccines work. That, that this is how I, I mean, I get the vaccine and I don't have to worry about getting the disease anymore. Right. Well, what about these 13 kids that all got the disease that they were vaccinated against? If it works so well, how are they getting it? That's right. I think there's an alternate explanation as to why people aren't getting certain diseases anymore. There could be many factors included as to why people aren't getting certain diseases anymore. How many people you know that have the bubonic plague? Have you even heard of that, like recently? Yeah, was it a big deal at one point in history? Sure it was. You know what, there's been lots of plagues and pestilences that have come and gone throughout history without the use of any form of vaccinations. They have run their course throughout the world and basically go away. Yeah. Now, some of those go away when it just comes to overall cleanliness and understanding that you shouldn't be introducing this, you know, unclean things into your body, whether it be directly through your blood because of instruments used in surgery or because of your food source, your drinking source, because of chemicals that are sprayed onto the food that you eat to keep insects away. And again, that's at the time, oh man, these are great. We've tested this is safe, effective. DDT. Yeah, tell me about how safe that is again. But hey, at the time, that was the big thing. Man, this stuff is great. We're going to use this. We're going to have these great high yields of crops. We don't have to worry about these bugs. Everything's great. Oh, except that now you're ingesting poison because even when you try to wash it off, you're still not getting it all and, and, and people are, are getting sick and dying as a result of this thing that was proclaimed by the U.S. government as being safe and effective and nothing's wrong with it. Oh, yeah, but that was then. We know that that was wrong. Yeah, but what about today? You mean to tell me? Science has got a grip on everything. The government's got it all under control. If they say it's safe, it's safe, man. I'm going with it. That is a foolish way of thinking. If you're going to rely on that as just being your guide, what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. If the government says it's good, it's good. Yeah, it's laughable. It really is. Here's an alternate explanation. And I have these printouts here. And you can check these out afterwards if you'd like or get a copy of them. These are readily available. This is information, by the way, that you can collect from government sources, from CDC. This isn't just independently made up facts or whatever. It, and it, it's going to be hard for some people to see, but basically this is mortality rates. So on the left, this is the number of deaths per 100,000 people. Okay? That's the vertical going up and down here. So obviously the higher it is, the worse it is. There's more people dying from that disease. And then you have time. So this is from 1900 to 1963. Okay? This is the range that we're looking at. And then different colors are different diseases. So green is measles, you got scarlet fever, typhoid, whooping cough, and diphtheria. These arrows are pointing to different events in our history for the various disease. But isn't it interesting, first of all, just to look at the number of deaths, how they all are following a trend and meeting up and having that very similar rate of mortality 
even though they started off kind of different, they're all funneling down. They didn't all have vaccines introduced at the same time or whatever, but they're all going the same direction. Why? Because in the 1920s and 30s, when it's on the decline already, this is when there's been, science is, is starting to realize more about the importance of cleanliness. All of a sudden, things aren't as bad. People aren't dying as much. That one thing has a huge impact. But now when you look at this, like right here, this point, this is when the whooping cough vaccine is in widespread use in the late 40s. But the vaccine saved us. Wait, it was introduced here. How about the measles vaccine? It's not even a blip. It's, I mean, it's flatlined already at that point. As far as the number of deaths is concerned, okay, now this isn't the number of people that have, you know, again, just, just to be clear what the information is, this isn't just the total number of people who have the disease. But see, there's a problem also with statistics. I mean, they're as good as they are. They don't lie. They, they are what they are. But there are underlying information you have, to un you have to realize about some things. For example, the number of people who have whooping cough today is probably higher than you realize. Because if someone goes to a doctor and they start having these symptoms, but they say, well, I've been vaccinated. Have you been vaccinated against it? Yes, I have. Well, then it can't be that. So they just throw that out. Right. Right. That just, it can't be that. So, so they start researching other things. And generally, like the whooping cough, you're going to have, you know, a lot of symptoms with diseases overlap, right? So you can have symptoms. Well, that kind of sounds, you know, my, my child had croup. Well, you can hear a croup cough and a whooping cough cough, and they're, they're similar. I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but you can start thinking like, well, maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, or, you know. And they're not always going to take blood work and do this stuff when you have a flu or a cold or whatever. And there's a lot of misdiagnosis just as a result of that because, well, it can't be that because you already have the vaccine. So it's already given out. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you can look at this. This is, this is um, the diphtheria vaccine was introduced in 1920, already on its way down. Um, the one that everyone likes to bring up is polio, right? What about polio? That is like the standard because that's the one that had the most national attention. You know, we had a president that had polio and it is a very serious disease. I mean, there's a lot of people that got paralyzed as a result. And it's not downplaying the severity of the disease itself. And, you know, people are trying to say, oh, you anti-vaxxers, it's because you weren't around during this. You didn't see the, the impact of this disease and how horrible it was, as if we're trying to downplay the disease. I'm not downplaying the disease at all. Right. Not at all. I'm challenging whether or not the vaccine is what is actually helping in eliminating it. It's not downplaying the disease. I'm not, I'm not so ignorant to just be flippantly saying, well, who cares about polio? As in, it, would, it wouldn't be a big deal if, if people got it today. No, it's not what we're saying at all. What I'm saying is, hey, let's look at the polio cases from 1937 to 2013. Again, with your timeline on the bottom, and you, this is your actual infection, your cases of polio. Oh, look how bad it was over here. Look at how bad it was in the late 1940s. Now look at 1955 when the vaccine was actually introduced by that big red line. It is already on a dramatic decrease. But vaccine saved the day. Let's give all the credit to the vaccine and let's pump a lot more money into the research and mass production of these vaccines. I don't have the statistics on that, but when people are pushing and the government's starting to push for vaccines, getting government contracts, especially from a producer that's going to say, hey, I can't be sued for this. I've got a government source. The government always overspends, yep. always overspends on whatever they get involved in because it's not their money. Right. See, there's a huge difference between 
government spending and private spending. When you have your own budget, it's your own money. You go, I don't want to spend that much money. I'm going to find, I'm going to find the cheapest way to do this and the best way to do this without having to spend all of my resources. But when it's, Hey, here's a bunch of random people that you don't know. And we just have this big pot of, you know, millions or billions of dollars. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, how much is that going to cost? Great. Move on to the next thing. Doesn't matter. It's, it's all just, it's all just someone else's money. I'm not going to get into all the government stuff, but that's uh, just a little dose, pun intended. And then you have the, another chart with the deaths from polio. So you have the cases of polio, I showed you that one, and this is the number of deaths again. Where the vaccine is introduced, you can see where it intersects the line there. You can see how well that correlates. Number of infections, number of deaths, already on the decline. You mean to tell me that the vaccine is really responsible for that? I don't think so. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying nothing is responsible for that. There may be something, but the evidence, if I look at the information, does not appear to point to the vaccine as being the source of why that got wiped out. Now, if, you introduce, if this line was like over here and it was on its way up and then, oh, wait, look, this was introduced and now it's on its way down. And I would expect it to go up a little bit more, too, because if it's just being introduced and then it's starting to be used, you're going to still hit it before it peaks and becomes effective and then comes. I mean, if, if I was going to look at information and say, yep, that's the result, that was the, that's what, what fixed it. Not the, OK, it intersects at this point, but in order for it really to be effective, to have any meaningful, visible result, I mean, it'd have to be like another year minimum just to see statistically anything change. Don't buy into it. I'll keep this information up here. It's available for you. Understand that medical science or whatever science, whatever the, the leading trend of the day is, whatever diet fad there is, whatever it is that you hear, you know, just because it's the newest thing doesn't mean it's the best thing. We like looking back to the old ways, like from everlasting, where we know the truth is. This, this doesn't have to be established for us anymore. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ to save your soul, you don't need to be questioning and wondering, well, is the Bible really true? I'm going to see what lines up with this first and then make my decision. And if I see someone going, hey, you have to, you have to get a clean thing out of an unclean thing, I'm going to say, hold on, no, that doesn't make sense. That's not the way God made things in this world. I reject that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And because it's truth, you'll always be able to find the rest of the evidence. It's just the truth. It's out there. But when there's a lot of money to be made, you're also going to find a lot of propaganda and lies. And like I said at the beginning, you know, people who are doing this and pushing vaccines, I'm not saying that they're evil, wicked people as far as just your average doctor or your Walgreens staff or whatever. They just don't know any better. It's just like the, the, you know, the people who are deceived by a false religion. Yeah. They're wrong. That's right. They may be sincerely wrong and think they really have the truth or the right answers, but they're wrong. People who are following Muhammad or you know, Islam, they may be sincere in their faith, but they're sincerely wrong. And the doctor trying to push the vaccine, they maybe it's sincere, they may care about you and love you, but they're wrong. It's not, it's not something that we should be doing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this light, the light of your word to, to help us to make good choices, to make good decisions, Lord. I ask that you'd please just help us to um, be able to challenge all that we hear, especially the stuff from this world, Lord, that, that we can compare it to your words. Help us to learn 
your words and help us to, to know and be ready to make good judgments and good decisions on what's right, what's true, what's false. Um, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of bad information out there, Lord. And um, I thank you. We thank you for providing us with this piece of information found in the Holy Bible that we know is true. And um, Lord, give us discernment and wisdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.